So I think there's a disconnect between what people are building on the blockchain and what the use cases are. There's a lot of beautiful ideas of how to streamline existing blockchain operations, how they can have some gimmicky trading tools and so on and so forth. But thinking about what business case you can solve and what value you bring to customers is a much harder problem. So the fact that tokens imploded and people withdraw money from this sector is not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't necessarily affect the people who are already seriously working on projects. In that sense, I think one should separate the craziness of, of prices from the, from the real work that is being done. That's Andreas Park. He's a professor of finance at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, with a cross appointment to the Rotman School of Management. He's also the research director at the financial innovation lab, FinHub, and the co-founder of U of T's blockchain research lab, LedgerHue. He studies blockchains, digital currencies, payment innovations, decentralized finance, and more. And the past couple of years have been a very busy time for his research. Blockchains and cryptocurrencies dominated the news this summer. After a meteoric rise starting in 2020, it seemed as though the decade-old technology was finally coming into its own. In 2021 and early 2022, it was impossible to venture online without hearing chatter of this chain or that. But then in May 2022, the fortunes seemed to turn. Now, analysts bandy about the term like crypto winter and crypto meltdown. Companies that were intrigued by the technology but hadn't yet dipped their toes in were given reason to pause. But is that wise? Cryptocurrency and blockchain have been hailed as game changers. Will ignoring the space leave businesses scrambling to catch up? Welcome to the Executive Summary. I'm Megan Haynes, editor of the Rotman Insights Hub. If you're a crypto-curious business, you really need to understand the terminology. A blockchain is just a decentralized digital ledger, or shared database, that records past transactions. And the data is validated by a piece of code. Cryptocurrency, meanwhile, is a payment system native to a specific blockchain. Effectively, you use a blockchain's cryptocurrency to access the service on that particular platform. We'll get into some of those services in a minute. While some currencies are backed by fiat currency, or currencies used by governments around the world, like the Canadian or U.S. dollar, most cryptocurrencies are unlocked via mining. At its simplest, mining is the act of a computer system solving complex mathematical problems. The first to find the solution is awarded the cryptocurrency, which can also be called a token. These tokens can be used for transactions on their blockchain, or they can be traded and sold like stock. People are likely familiar with Bitcoin, the first cryptocurrency and blockchain on the market. Bitcoin is a purely digital currency that's mined through a network of computers. Over the past few years, Bitcoin has seen a steady increase in its value, with people buying up Bitcoins with fiat currencies typically on the speculation that it would continue to rise in value. I think it was in the late 1990s or early 2000s, we had Beanie Babies. And uh, people traded them for thousands of dollars. It's very hard to describe why Beanie Baby could have possibly the value of multiple thousands of dollars. But there was a kind of a frenzy at the time for it because they were rare and people could exchange them. And so in that sense, Bitcoin is not very different from, from that idea. Is you were willing to pay for Bitcoin what you think it's worth to you. Nothing pins down the price, though. And so in that sense, you know, the entire value of, of these items can fluctuate quite wildly. And, and it does, as we can see. Since Bitcoin launched in 2008, other platforms like Ethereum popped up, expanding on the utility of the blockchain. Ethereum, for example, uses its cryptocurrency Ether to pay for other computational services. And while currency is still the most common use for crypto, there have been some recent innovations in this space, such as the advent of utility tokens. You can use those in order to access a particular type of service, such as uh, decentralized file storage. Filecoin is an example for that. There are three different types of stablecoin. Stablecoin is a digital representation of a fiat currency. Um, that's quite prominent, and it allows people to... 
uh, send dollar amounts uh, all across uh, the world without using a bank or using any other type of financial institution. Then there are also uh, stable coins that are backed by crypto. And essentially, the way it works is somebody makes a deposit of a crypto asset. And then in relation to the deposit that is being made, the person can mint, so create new tokens, which are essentially then a loan. And those, this loan then trades one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar. And then there are the fairy tale voodoo tokens, such as the UST token that recently spectacularly collapsed, which are algorithmic stable coins where people basically trying to make up money out of thin air uh, by having a computer code run a Senoraj business. Those tokens are non-collateralized. And as we know from the history of finance, uh, non-collateralized uh, or under-collateralized loans banks and so on and so forth are subject to runs. And if there's a run on such a currency or on such a system, uh, the whole system can collapse. We have asset tokens. Asset tokens essentially just um, describe ownership of a particular item. So for instance, um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens that are linked to a digital piece of art are a very good example of an asset token. And of course, you can easily imagine a situation in which any type of asset that exists in the real world, um, you can have property registry, you can have car ownership, you can think of stocks, bonds, and the like. All of those assets can in principle be tokenized and can then be exchanged and run and used in financial applications on a blockchain. And the futures and derivatives tokens. It's a token which is based on the value of other tokens. So just like the futures that we trade on regulated exchanges, there are also futures contracts which circulate on the blockchain. And finally, we have governance tokens. Uh, those are tokens which are often issued in the context of so-called DIOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. The idea is to take some of the decisions that are being made and democratize them so that the investors themselves can make a decision and not a manager on their behalf. Many of these new uses for cryptocurrencies followed a crypto boom bust cycle in 2018. Once the hype of 2018 was over um, and people could actually think again about what they wanted to build, really, as opposed to just thinking about what happens to their token prices, their token, you know, going up, they were actually, actually doing the hard work. The fruits of this labor came with the DeFi boom of 2020 and then 2021 had the boom in NFTs. Businesses also began exploring the blockchain world. Taco Bell and Pizza Hut used limited edition NFTs for marketing tactics. Tesla announced it would accept Dogecoin as a form of payment for its brand merch. In the U.S., grocer Kroger tested the use of blockchain to track the provenance of its food items. But despite the recent boom in investment, the hype could only last for so long. Let's pause here to talk about what began in May 2022. As the broader stock market began to tumble, blockchains around the world began to see investors pull out. Bitcoin's market value dropped from a high of more than $64,000 in November 2021 to just $21,000 the following June. Ethereum saw a 66% decline in its trading value, while a pair of so-called stable coins or stable-backed coins called Terra, UST, and Luna Terra saw their values drop a whopping 99% in just over a week. Some investors started getting dot-com bubble flashbacks. There's a large number of problems that arose in the late 1990s. It was difficult to define what value the internet would bring. And there was a lot of ideas out there. Many of them were simply not viable. So an example, for instance, a firm that had the idea that they could sell plants over the internet uh, they were in existence for just a few months. They went public. They raised over $150 million at the time, which was a monstrous amount. And essentially, they never shipped a single plant. There's a lot of crazy ideas that were out there at the time. And the general I boom of ideas makes people be willing to throw money at anything. Eventually, everything comes to a, a grinding halt when you know the economics gets detached from reality too much. And in many ways, we saw the same thing in this crypto boom and bust is there were a large number of really interesting applications, but the sector attracted so much money so quickly that it was actually pretty difficult for genuinely interesting projects to get any attention. So there's a lot of talk about whether or not all of these tokens are scams and all of them are essentially Ponzi schemes. 
based only on the idea that the only way how they can function is by an ever increasing number of people pouring money into a network and that's it. Essentially, cryptocurrencies rode the wave of potential and speculation rather than actual usefulness. People were happy to continue to invest money because of its potential payoff at the end, but few companies were able to explain or put a clear picture to what that payoff was actually going to be. And part of the problem is that blockchains and cryptocurrencies are not very user-friendly. You don't just visit a website to mine cryptocurrency. Accessing the value of your crypto or converting it to a fiat currency like a Canadian dollar is quite difficult. The average person on the street doesn't have cryptocurrencies in their digital wallet, and even if they did, there isn't exactly a lot they could actually buy with it. If you want to use blockchain, it's actually pretty complex. It's a multi-step process. It can be quite nerve-wracking. Because it is hard to use, there's also the propensity for fraud and theft and so on and so forth. Part of the problem, Andreas says, is the lack of ubiquity in this category. You need to have people who actually liaise with customers, um, but it actually requires people interactions and understanding human beings and how they use it. And that's kind of missing in this space. Not to put too fine a point to it, but really the industry needs a Steve Jobs. There's also a lot of regulatory work that still needs to happen, and there's little political will at the moment, in Canada at least, to push forward the technology and help give it a boost. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I worry that Canada is a million miles away, and much further away than others. There's currently no thinking, at least I cannot see any thinking on any level of the government which says, how can we leverage this and make, uh, make it work for Canada? How can we be a player in this space? How can we enable it? Despite this crypto winter, businesses shouldn't ignore the space completely. The dot-com bust winnowed out some of the dead weight that simply received money for existing, ultimately paving the way for Google, Facebook, and Amazon to grow. My expectation is that now people probably go back to the drawing board and hopefully we'll find actually the applications that then shape the genuine usage of blockchains going forward. And as of July 2022... Countries like the UK and Germany were still actively exploring or had implemented cryptocurrency strategies, not to grow the value of the cryptocurrency, but to look at the underlying technology. So for the crypto-curious businesses, keep in mind that while the dollars might be outflowing, the technology that makes crypto and blockchain so interesting are still being developed, because we've really only just scratched the surface of blockchain's potential. Simple things like if you are a provider of, say, exchange-traded funds, and you want to build these exchange-traded funds and to organize them in a meaningful way, it's actually an enormous back-office operation. It's very inefficient and extremely costly. So if you have a mutual fund company, at least half of the people employed there work on the back office just to jerry-rig the different databases and silo uh, asset systems together. And you can do that on a blockchain in a much more efficient manner, in a much more seamless manner, and save enormously on these back office costs. Andreas also sees big opportunity for blockchain in the world of global trade, HR and accounts management, loyalty program tracking, and more. Every business has to ask themselves, as, am I a business that could be replaced by a process which runs on the blockchain? So am, am I a business which basically just keeps assets safe, for instance, for people, a database that maintains information, then that's a problem. Am I a business where I, I make sure that transfers can occur? So like an agent for trade finance, then that's something you may be disintermediated. I mean, this is, seems like small problems, but you would have to follow the space also carefully if you look at, for instance, loyalty programs, because I believe that these will eventually be used in the form of NFTs. And if you don't have a, a plan to use an NFT, then your, you know, a, a physical plastic card will not be the future, right? The reality is, is that a blockchain is a very useful piece of technology for borderless digital transfers of value. And so in that sense, I, I cannot see a world in which this is not used and this is not useful. 
This has been Rotman Executive Summary, a podcast bringing you the latest insights and innovative thinking from Canada's leading business school. Special thanks to Professor Andreas Park. We'll be back in a few weeks with Professor Pankaj Agarwal to talk about the future of anthropomorphized brands. This episode was written and produced by Megan Haynes and Jesse Park. It was recorded by Dan Mazzotta and edited by Avery Moore Gloss. For more innovative thinking, head over to the Rotman Insights Hub and subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, or SoundCloud. Thanks for tuning in.